What was? What do you think? Um, what has the re reception been for the uh, pilot so far? Have you seen how that's done so far since it did air two days ago now? I think we did okay from a number standpoint. Oh, do, ratings or reviews or reviews? Um, I think that there's there. You know, I haven't read a single one. I, I've, <laughs> I've read a bunch, and you know, there's it, today. It's so different. I mean, there's social media, and then there's reviewers. And I think that the reviews have been some good, some questioning the fact that only Janet can see Mary, um, but liking the family aspect of it. So all in all, I'd say we're pretty pleased. The social media feedback was really positive. I get these reports, and it was like 88% positive on social media with a lot of activity. So um, I like to try to make something different, and, and, and you know, it's the first time anyone's ever done CG animation on a television show with live action. So we were learning as we went, and it was great. And so on that note, what was the biggest challenges for you two in trying to bring the character Mary to life and the show to life? I think the um, biggest challenge is tough because there are so many. Mm -hmm. I think first was just finding the right actress to voice her. Mm -hmm. um, we had, in truth, offered it to a couple of people and then heard them and it wasn't quite right. Uh, and then we sort of decided to change our strategy and just sort of had more of like a we'll do just truly audition people and instead of a straight offer and we listened to you know a hundred different actresses play the part and this was after we had actually already shot it at that point point. and Rachel just sort of was head and shoulders better than it was just it made it something new so but that was a, a long road that took months and months and then fine tuning the character I mean the character looks very different now than it did. Um, when we shot the pilot first a year ago. But it, it had a bunch of challenges because, once again, no one had ever done it before on a TV schedule. So, so we're like barn animals. We're used to shooting shows in Los Angeles, unlike dramas who have to go out of town and, and shoot all over the place. We shoot in, in the town. So this was shot in Vancouver, which faced its own challenges for doing a comedy. Where do you set up a writer's room? How do you send somebody up to the set? How do you make all, you know, how do you come up with comedy alts, punch ups? Um, the process of shooting it. Do you use a tennis ball? Do you use a green screen? Do you use nothing? So for Jenna, it was an eyeline nightmare figuring out where to look. Uh, and just figuring out how we're going to do this thing. And Sean Levy, who did the pilot with us, was really instrumental in bringing the energy of Mary. A lot of the, because we didn't have an actress in the beginning, as David was saying, Sean acted it out on set. He would jump up and do Mary, hopping up on tables. And Sean Levy's such an energetic guy that so much of the of that is baked into Mary's DNA now because once we started animating it, a little bit it was following what Sean was doing. So the, every step of the way there were new challenges for us, which was fun because we're used to making television shows and you can do a single camera comedy and you hope the cast works, but this faced a lot of new hurdles and post-production was different. The whole thing was different. Well, Jenna herself is such a physical performer. Are the scripts writing to that or is she just finding places to I think it's both. We know how great she is and how good she is at that, so we were certainly looking for those things wherever we can. And at the same time, she, her instincts are so unique that if she may have an idea to add something that we weren't thinking about that she can sort of work into on set. So it's a little bit of both. And, and particularly the, the thing that she did with that none of us had talked about, which was, because it's such a fine line between talking to your imaginary friend and being a crazy person, and, and she really found that line, and, and thankfully we think never really crossed it, but just sort of the way she could talk to Mary when somebody was around and react without reacting. She found these small moments that none of us ever talked about that she just instinctively got that were great. And on that note, I wanted to ask you, because people today seem very sensitive and somebody's always offended by the color green or whatever, because they're Irish or whatever, whatever. Did you guys worry about that and that, that mental Jewish. illness people that might... <laughs> I don't think she is. There's a huge internal debate about this. But uh, do you guys worry at all about people barking in about mental illness and stuff at all? Or did you talk about um, that? We didn't. I think probably because... It's ultimately born out of her childhood experience, and everyone knows what it's, it's... We always thought of it as a positive thing to sort of... To be able to sort of think big enough that she can dream up this person. It's not just... It's really just a voice in her head to work stuff out the same way that we all have these internal dialogues about what we're going to... From small things like, what am I going to eat today, to big things about, like, what's the next job I'm going to do or not do. Um, and so we're just really bringing that to life. So we didn't worry about it too much.
What other crazy adventures are Mary and Alice going to get into? I mean, a lot of this stems from David's own experience of being a, um, a divorced dad with kids and getting and marrying a woman who didn't have children. So, you know, fortunately, we have a good roadmap. So far, we just, we just, we just went away for the week for a few days in an RV trip, and I would have to say, I don't know. Um, so we you might know, see Mary yeah, in, uh, exactly. in an RV trip next no, year. No, really, it is. You know, at its heart, it's a family show. And a woman who's also wants to like maintain the sort of modern feminist identity while still being getting integrated into a family and sort of seeing those things coexist. So it's really watching. You know, we kind of have a, a natural sort of evolution of these relationships and sort of seeing how everyone responds to Alice in their lives and how Alice responds to being like looked upon as a maternal figure when it's not her instinct. So it's really just sort of watching the course of the relationship. Yeah. Any plans down the line for anyone else to be able to see Mary? Has that been thrown around at all? Probably. We throw around all sorts of crazy ideas. I think right now, um, you know, really at its heart, like I just said, it's a voice in someone's head to help externalize the, in the internal struggles we all have. And then maybe if there were a bunch of those, then that idea kind of goes away and becomes something else. Um, that being said, you know, it's certainly fun to talk about. Right. And, and anything's possible, because early on we would get some, you know, everybody has notes and you get different people's thoughts, and we would get notes like, how does Mary drive story? And it actually sparked a lot of debate, because, because she's only part of Alice's um, psyche, she can either give bad advice or good advice, but ultimately so... You know, the only way she can really drive story is if more people can see her. The original pitch was Ted meets Modern Family, and the difference is if Ted was here, we'd all see Ted. Uh, so we had a lot of conversations, and this is where we landed. And you know, as any show evolves, you never know. Yeah. Right. Has there oh, been any consideration of having another imaginary character, like a nemesis to Mary? <laughs> um, well, when you sit with Patrick and, and, and you talk to him about it, in his mind, I think that he would love to create a whole world where. There's imaginary friends who sort of have this world that's that's out there. And you know, getting back to your question about, oh, we're worried about mental illness. One of the things we looked at before and the thing that we uh, looked at was that something like 68% of all kids had imaginary friends growing up. So it's not really a case of mental illness as much as it is your imagination. And 70% of all adults wish they had one. So right. it just seemed like a perfect, you know, melding of those two things. And uh, did you guys look, uh, clearly did some research on it, but uh, what, what, what's the cutoff? Where do we, people stop having an imaginary friend and it becomes, you need to go and talk to the therapist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is where David turns to his back. Well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think there are certain up, things like that. Hey, Patrick. We, we didn't, I mean, I think for kids, it's up until around 9 or 10. It's sort of the late end, probably. But, um, and Adam Goldberg, I think it was 24. Right. Yes. Yeah. Last week. Yeah, <laughs> still with us. But uh, we just sort of made a decision to not, to just really look at it as, we're just inside Alice's head about like what she's sort of struggling with, so we didn't delve too deep as far as, you know, once... Because we thought about it for too long, you know, it all breaks down. Everything right. goes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.